for 7 o'clock. Time to begin tonight. Glad you're here. We'll continue tonight on the Beatitudes. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, looking at the uh, second Beatitude that Christ spoke there. We'll begin the word of prayer first. Michael, Randa, let's pray, please. Matthew 5 and verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There's a difference in crying and mourning. We know there's a difference there. We've all cried before. We've all mourned before. It may be in our mourning we have cried. So uh, it may be in our mourning that we have not cried. But either way, there are two different things there. It's not that just mourning and crying go together, but they are different things, but but they are very similar. They go hand in hand. Even the Bible describes them in two different ways. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4, here Solomon says, A time to weep, and there's your crying, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. So there's a time for both. There's a time in life that crying takes place. There's a time there when mourning takes place. So the Bible speaks of both of them as as well, separately. Uh, They are different. We find many examples in the Bible of both mourning and weeping in the Scriptures. You find Joseph there in Genesis 43 and verse 30. Whenever he revealed himself to his brothers Uh, there he was weeping because of that Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4 when Nehemiah heard about the condition of Jerusalem he went to a state of mourning Jairus in Mark chapter 5 you know his daughter died young daughter he was both crying and mourning at her death when he he was there to get Christ to come back and to raise her from the dead. The widow, Luke Luke 7, 13, she was en route to bury her son. Christ raised him from the dead. Well, there was a a state of both mourning and crying in her condition. Even Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus in John 11, 35, it speaks there, Jesus wept, that short verse. And then you have your professional mourners. Uh, Mark 5, 39 through 40. That's how they made a living. It really wasn't anything that was from the heart. They could just, you know, drop of a moment there. They could uh, start mourning over somebody's death or whatever. Start shed the tears. And, well, when time was up, okay, we're going to go and, you know, go somewhere else. And let the next group come in, they could start. So. You had even those in the Bible who were professional mourning mourners. So we know there's a lot of weeping in the Bible. We know there's a lot of mourning in the Bible as well. But we go back to Matthew 5, 4. When Christ says, blessed are those who mourn, He's not talking here about weeping when crying. And He's not talking here about the, the mourning part when everyone is... Uh, in a state of extreme sadness. He's not talking about that either. But whatever he's talking about, there's comfort that can be given in this. Uh, we, uh, again, some people, when they get mad, they cry. It's not tears of you know, sadness. They just get hot and they get mad. And they start crying. People get hurt. They start crying sometimes. People mourn, but he's not talking about that kind of dealings here. What he's talking about is when we think about our our sinful condition, what does that bring about? What what do we think about? Do do we have a state of crying when I think about 
maybe my condition before I became a Christian. And I think about my condition now, even I'm still a sinner, but I'm forgiven, of course. But does it cause me to mourn because of what I've done in my life? Does that cause me to mourn? That's what he's talking about. When we think about sin, and we're going to look at some more here in a little bit, how some think about sin, how they look at it. But when we think about sin overall and bring it home to our sin, does it cause sadness to think that what I've done had to brought about the death of Christ so I could be saved? My sin. A good example of this is in Luke 7. Here's a woman who comes to Christ and look at her, her condition. 7, 37, and 38 of Luke. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flat flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So here's a lady, this woman, the Bible says she was a sinner, but that's not meaning she was just your common, everyday sinner. We all sin. But this woman had a reputation about something. A reputation. She was known as a sinner. Whenever her name was brought up, you knew exactly what the sin was that she was committing. It's well known. But here's a woman. She comes to Christ. And she has this oil, and there she begins to weep, and she begins to wash her feet, his feet with her tears, and she dries his feet with her hair, and then she puts the oil there on Christ. Her sin drove her to do this. She realized her condition, and she realized there's only one person that can help me in my condition. And she goes there, and there she is weeping because of her condition. She had some pain. It wasn't a phys physical pain. It wasn't really necessarily a, a mental pain, we might call. This woman had a pain dealing, dealing with sin. It really was getting to her. And, uh, and she probably had a lot of sin to forgive to, how, to be known as a sinner. So she comes understanding her position to Christ. And she goes down on her hands and knees and, and there she's at his feet. Uh, there's somebody that uh, understands it. And the last week we talked about the, the beggar. Uh, blessed are the poor. Well, this woman will fall into that category as well. But well, she's begging. She's right there to feed the Christ, and she's begging for some help that will come from him. So she didn't come to Christ because she was sick physically. She didn't come to Christ because somebody was dead in her family or dying. She came because of sin, and she was aware of that. i got to do something about this. And then we go to verse 47, where the story is continued, Luke 7, 47. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then in verse 50, he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. She left different than what she and how she arrived. And that's a good thing. She entered broken. She entered with this weight of sin upon her. And then she leaves with that sin forgiven. No more. She had a lot of them, many of them. But every one of them was forgiven. And 
And we should have the same you know, thought about us whenever we, we come to Christ, become Christians. We should have that feeling of forgiveness. Everyone has been lifted off of us. Uh, we, we, we probably all of us know somewhat when we you know, do something against somebody or somewhat and we go and we ask for their forgiveness and, and, and we're forgiven and everything's back in a good position. That's a good feeling. But to have that feeling toward God, to know we're forgiven, would be even a, a greater feeling that we should have. And she had that feeling. Her faith has saved her. What great words to come from Christ. You know, she had faith there that he would do, he could save her, he would forgive her. She knew who he was, the Son of God. Look what James had to say about sin. James 4, 8 to 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Too often we have this attitude of sin that it's, that it's funny. That it's fun. Well, sin is fun. If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't be doing near as much of it. But uh, here... Sometimes we have become desensitized to sin because of mainly television, everything that goes on there, and, and we see it, and hey, we know that, that morality is wrong there. We know that the wording is wrong and everything about it, in, in many cases, is wrong. But hey, we, we go on about it, and next week we tune in again and watch the same, same deal. Well, verse 9 there, he says, Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. When we think about sin, we shouldn't be laughing about it. We should be mourning about it because of what it's done. What it's done to each of us. What it continues to do and what it can do. We don't, have to, we don't need to be joyful about this. About sin. It's gloom to think about it. We always walk around in a state of mourning, in a state of gloom because sin... No, we don't do that. But we don't understand what sin is about and how it affects us. Uh, it can afflict us uh, spiritually. It can do that. So uh, hopefully we understand the true meaning of sin. We have the mourning. We have the gloom. And then we let the Lord pick us up. And he tells us, you're forgiven. I'm not going to hold this against you. That's a good thing to know. Let him pick us up. Uh, no laughing matter. And yet how many times do we have, have heard people laugh about sin? I mean, their own personal sin. They just laugh about it. Brag about it. Sin has, has no way is to be bragged about. No way. But yet many people will brag about their sin, what they have done, how many times they did it, who they hurt, Whatever, it's nothing to be uh, bragged about. It's forgiven. It doesn't need to be brought up again. But to go back to, uh, again, back to the Beatitude, Matthew 5, 4. A uh, person who has this attitude, the mourning attitude, they're going to be blessed and they're going to be comforted in doing this. This is not a Sometimes they call it jailhouse repentance. A person goes to jail and all of a sudden they get, they try to find them sometimes a Bible and they, and they got change and change can happen. But many times it's just for the moment I stand before the judge that I'm released and many times they go right back to what they're doing. And that's, a, and that's sometimes what happens. But the person who's really mourning I'm not going to go back to it. They understand what has happened. And I probably shed a lot of tears because of their behavior. And probably other people shed a lot of tears because of their behavior. And knowing that, they're not going to go back to it. They understand their sin. They understand their disobedience, rebellion, stubbornness, understand all that. And they're not going to go back to it. 
And that's the kind of response that God wants us to have toward Him. Uh, to truly mourn in our soul. I'm not going back to that. No more. In Luke 18, verse 13, the uh, tax collector, or publican, some versions say, uh, he had the right attitude. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's got to be our attitude as well. When we think about our sin, it would be hard to look at God. When you have really hurt somebody with sin, it's difficult to look them in the face. Difficult to do. So here this man here, the tax collector, understanding his condition, he couldn't even look up to God. Couldn't do it. But yet that's the kind of attitude that God wants us to have. Understand our condition that only he can give relief from. He can show us mercy. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow. That's what the Beatitudes talking about. Godly sorrow. If I'm really Sorry for what I've done. That's going to bring about repentance. And then the repentance will bring about salvation. That's what it will do. If I really have the right sorrow. If I don't, I don't have the proper sorrow, then it's not going to work. If I have the right sorrow and I repent, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's what it's called, Repentance. It's not just I repent today and do it tomorrow again. When I repent of this, I stop it. I stop it. Don't go that way anymore. We see this in Peter. When Christ, uh, when he denied Christ in Matthew 26, 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. There's your sorrow, the weeping that he had. That's good for Peter to do that. It had been something else that Peter went out and sort of bragged about it. Or if he left and, and hadn't been weeping about it, well, boy, I made a mistake tonight. Well, that Christ, he was right. He was right. He told me that. Now he went out and he wept. And then on the resurrection morning when those ladies talked to the angel there at the tomb, Mark 16, 7. They said, but go tell his disciples and Peter. Tell Peter. Peter needed this. No other, no other disciple did what Peter did. Now, they all fled. They weren't around. But Peter denied him. I don't know him. And the words came out. Other disciples, they scattered also whenever he was arrested in the garden. But Peter tagged along and there he said the words that he said. And here we find it. Christ calls him out by name. You tell Peter. You tell Peter. It's okay. It's going to be all right. It took a little while for Peter to get over this. And it was later that when Christ met with the disciples and he asked Peter three times, do you love me? It took him a little while to get over it. It just wasn't, oh, he, he called my name, I'm okay. Peter still had to work through this. And Christ worked with him. He didn't want Peter to stay down. He made a mistake, Peter. You sinned, no doubt, you sinned. Repent of it, get over it. Got work to do, get over it. Earlier, Peter had the right attitude in Luke 5 and verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When he first really realized that this Jesus was not just an ordinary person, 
That's when he fell down. There's that understanding, that mourning. I'm in the presence of deity. I'm in the presence of God. And I need to realize where I stand. I'm a sinful person. And that's what Peter realized. And that's what he uh, spoke of right there. He did. Another in the Bible that had this attitude would be David. And we see his words in Psalms 51. 1 through 3. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always uh, before me. And that's the, that's the attitude that we got to have before God. Begging God, have mercy on me. Don't give me what I deserve. You know, David was confronted by uh, the prophet. Was it Nathan, the prophet? I think it was. But he was confronted. And David realized, I mean, I'm caught. And David repented of this. But there's three words here in this in these three verses. And they got different meaning, but they sort of all, all tied together. The word uh, sin is there. The word iniquity and the word transgression. They're all sin. They're all in the same bucket. But they got different meaning about them. And David committed all three of them. And that's what we got to be careful of. If we don't commit all three. Uh, one's enough. Like sin, that simply means to miss the mark. That's the most common term you find in the Bible, that when we sin, that's a very common term. We try to do what right, but we miss the mark. And that, that would be a, for a faithful Christian. We're trying to live, do what is right, live, what is, live in the right way, but we miss the mark. It happens. Well, David says, forgive me of that. Then he says, my iniquity. Iniquity is sin as well, so if it's deeply rooted, it's premeditated. That's a willful sin. I've been thinking about that sin for a long time. I've been planning on that sin for a long time. If the opportunity ever came up, I was going to jump at it. Premeditated. That's a very deep sin. And uh, David had that. I think about the, on, the, on the rooftop there, the premeditated, he began premeditating everything, especially when Bathsheba came in and she told him, I'm a child. He started premeditating the murder of her husband there, trying to cover it up. He says, I want forgiveness of that, those sins I've been planning. And then transgression, uh, we get that word, uh, English word for, for trespass, uh, when you cross the line, when you've gone too far. There's no trespassing sign. And uh, you can trespass and, and not really realize it. You'd be on somebody else's property. Maybe they don't want you there. Or there may be a sign there and you go on it anyway. Well, David realized, I crossed the line. I went too far. And it almost cost him. If he had not repented when Nathan came to him, a God would have taken his life, take, taken him out. But David understood the seriousness of sin the seriousness of iniquity and the seriousness of transgressions. And uh, he didn't want to go back there anymore. He had enough of it. It got to him. And the same thing is true on the day of Pentecost when Peter and the other apostles spoke to that large gathering of people. In Acts 2.37, when they heard this, what Peter had been telling them, and what he told them, you killed the Son of God. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. There's the mourning. They're in sadness. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's their repentance. And Peter told them, in verse 38, you know, repent and be baptized. And they, and they did. And in verse 41, and then those who gladly received this word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 
they gladly received the word. They were glad to hear it. They were glad to know I can get forgiveness for this. Glad to know. So that beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. It's not just talking about a person who's sad, who's having difficult times in life. Nothing seems to be going their way. No, it's not that. It's talking about our, our response to sin. Understanding how we stand before God. And we should be in a state of mourning to know what it did to, to the Son of God. What it cost Him. All right, anything on the second beatitude? Any comment on it? All right, we'll take up the third one. Next, our next uh, study. Thank you for your attention tonight.